Um, uh, it could be it. <laughs> no, you're using the lapel. Am you're I? on the lapel. Yeah, I'm supposed to be. Anyway, I had a conversation with a young man a little while back ago, and he asked me, why can't you go to church? I said, I go to church on Saturday. He goes, why do you go to church on Saturday? You go, well, because, you know, the Bible says that the Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. He goes, we go to church on Sunday. Like, everybody I know goes to church on Sunday. Why do you go to church on Sunday? He goes, are you Jewish? I don't know. And I asked him, why do you go to church on Sunday? He goes, I don't know, because everybody goes to church on Sunday. That's the day you're supposed to go to church. I said, well, I studied the Bible. And in studying the Bible, what I found is that from Genesis to Revelation, God speaks of a day. And um, it's a specific day. And so what God says in His Word is a day that I want to follow. And so what I find... I think you're on mute. <laughs> you got to hear. Me. And I didn't have glasses on, so yes, you're right, I'm on mute. <laughs> if my face turns really red, it's going to take a little while for that to actually flush out. <laughs> so in this conversation, he said to me, he goes, you know, I remember my parents talking to somebody about Saturday. And he goes, and they... My parents just told him they were legalists. He goes, are you a legalist? I said, well, it all depends on your perspective. So this morning, we want to look at, is Sabbath keeping a part of God's gospel? Has it always been a part of God's gospel plan? And if it is, what part of the gospel does it serve? So as we look in Hebrews chapter 4, Let's begin. I actually made a lot of notes for this, and I left them on my uh, desk at the house. So, so go home and get them away for me. So let's look at chapter four, and let's look at verse one. Now, first, is chapter four in the Old Testament of Hebrews? Is that in the Old Testament? <coughs> Okay, so what we're going to look at this morning is coming from New Testament, right? So if we're New Testament Christians and we find this in the New Testament, then Sabbath keeping is for New Testament Christians. So let's set that and let's start with verse 1. So verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. What's the context here? The context is entering God's rest, and God has made a promise that we are able to enter that rest. Now, is this a new promise, or is this an old promise? Okay, now, what you're going to find is from the days of the fall of Adam and Eve, all the way to our day, this is the same promise. The promise of entering God's rest. And I love Hebrews chapter 4 because... This is the chapter that explains why Sabbath keeping is important for a New Testament Christian and what it actually means. So first of all, we can know that there is a promise of entering his rest. And then it says, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So there's a promise and there's a warning. The promise is, is that we can enter the rest. The warning is what? That we fall short and not enter it. So is this something important for the Christian today? Verse 2, for indeed the gospel, what's the gospel? The good news of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins, that Christ is the way that we can 
come to the Father. Christ is the way to solve the sin problem inside of us. That in Christ, we have salvation full and free. Amen? Amen. Is that the gospel? Is that mentioned in the context here of Hebrews? Okay, you need to realize this because it's also mentioned in the context, context of entering God's rest. Seven, keep it. Okay? So, for indeed the gospel was preached to us, that's us, as well as to them. Who is the them? The Gentiles. No. Who is the them in the context that this is written? You probably have to go back to the last chapter, maybe the chapter before. The book of Hebrews was written, very good, that's who the them is. The book of Hebrews was written because, as I've said before, the Hebrew Christians were tired of persecution, tired of being ostracized. They had lost everything. And they were called to stay faithful to Christ. And they were growing weary. And some of them were leaving Christ and trying to go back and find salvation at the temple. And once Christ was crucified on the cross, was there any more salvation found in the sacrifice of animals? Could salvation be found in temple services? Okay, so if they left Christ to go back to the temple, then what was their standing with God when it came to their salvation? Something to think about. Okay, this is why we do not teach once saved, always saved. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And he made it very clear that no man comes to the Father except through him. He has to be the center of everything when it comes to your salvation. He has to be the center of everything when it comes to your life in general. But in the context of what we're reading here, those Hebrew Christians were growing weary. And so the writer is trying to bring them to an understanding of how important it is to endure all of this to the end, to stay faithful to Christ. And he brings them back to something that they would be very comfortable with and that they would know. And that is Old Testament history. So it says plainly that the gospel was preached to us, but also to them. That's the nation of Israel. Were they saved by some other way than the way you and I are saved today? See, this is again why we're not dispensationalists. Okay? God has made one way. When Cain and Abel came to bring their offerings, were they saved the same way you and I are saved today? Why was Abel's offering accepted and Cain's offering rejected? Because it wasn't what God required, right? God had a very specific um, instruction of how to approach Him. God was very specific of how you gained God's favor and how your sins were cleansed. Abel followed God's instructions and Cain didn't. The whole, the whole history of the nation of Israel was a history of being in a state of belief, believing that God will do what He said He would do, and then falling out of that. Falling into idolatry, falling into self-righteousness, going from a place of belief to unbelief, belief to unbelief. So He's going to bring you to this history of when they were in the desert, and God wanted to bring the entire nation into His rest. And for some reason, he makes this statement that we're going to read. I swore that they would never enter my rest. And you have to understand why he did that. So let's continue to read on. For indeed the gospel was preached, this is verse 2, chapter 4, to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not what? Did not profit them. Why did it not profit them? Because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. For he has said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. 
It's a quote from Psalm 95, 11. Why did the nation of Israel not enter God's rest? Say it loud. They didn't believe in Him. They would not believe. God did everything that He possibly could. He showed them miracle after miracle. He showed them His power. He showed them His strength. He showed them His love. And they kept falling into unbelief. To where it got to the point that God brings them to the promised land. They send in the spies. And you know the story. Twelve spies go out. How many come back with a good report? How many come back with a bad report? What was the history of the nation after that? Because of their unbelief. Two of the spies said, we can do this. Why? Because they thought their army was strong enough? No, because they had their faith in the God who had brought them this far. And the others said no. And the congregation said no. Unbelief. This is really important when you start talking about the gospel and Sabbath keeping. And it's really important when you start looking at end time events because nothing has changed and everything in this battle is still the same why did Eve fall same reason because she did not believe the word of God right unbelief why did Israel fail? Because of unbelief. Why is the church so weak today? Because of unbelief. This battle has always been the same. And Satan has his army. God has his army. And Satan has found that the best way to cause havoc and wreak havoc within God's people is through unbelief. And he has a million different ways to bring it to us, but we keep swallowing that same pill. And when we come to this last part of person history, it still comes down to whether God's people will believe and be ready to enter the promised land, or whether they'll continue in their unbelief and wander around in the desert. And this is where we're at today. The choice is right here in front of us, and you need to make the choice day by day. Do you believe what God's Word says? Do you believe that Christ is a all-in-all -all Savior? That He lacks nothing? Or do you believe that He's just not that big of a God and He can't actually take care of my problems? We like to say when things are going good, we have an awesome, powerful God. But when we're in the fire and we're put to the test, sometimes we wonder just how big our God is. So as we continue to read on, so I swore my wrath that they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. I always found that text really strange, how he worded this. For we who have believed do enter that rest. Okay? So as a Christian, you can enter that rest through Christ. And that door is open through the door of faith. And if you don't exercise that faith if you don't exercise belief. God has sworn that you will not enter His rest. Even though the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What does that last part mean? Any ideas? The works of salvation? that He is still upholding creation. Listen, this is a great verse. What it's telling you is that God's salvation has been completed. Completed, not in the process of being complete, but has been completed since the foundation of the world. Nothing takes God by surprise. This is why your salvation is sure. In Christ, you have assurance. And you can know that you're saved. Do you feel uncomfortable when the Baptists come to you and ask you, are you saved? The first answer out of your mouth is if you're in Christ, the answer should be yes, with no buts and no explanations. Are you in Christ? Yes. Has Christ saved you? Amen. Then what do you have to fear? 
That has been since the foundation of the world. It's done. It's over because he's going to bring you into the creation. And this is why we're given the Sabbath. So let's look. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What works were finished? The works of creation? Could you not say also the works of salvation? Did they come into place after the fall? Or did God have the plan before the fall? And that's kind of weak. This is, this is why you need to really understand and know this. This is what's going to get you through hard times. That you have an assurance that God loves you and God has done everything for you and that this has been done since the foundation of the world. Your salvation is sure. God has taken care of all of that. Okay? From the day of creation to our day today, there's not a question. God wasn't taken by surprise by sin. God had a plan. Do you believe that God saw your face the day He made Adam and Eve? Yeah. Do you believe that God's able to see the beginning to the end? Yeah. Does God know who you are? Yeah. Does He know even the hairs of your head? Yeah. Okay, so getting into this, because this is the meat of the message today. Verse 4. For He has spoken in a certain place of which day? Sabbath what day is that? <laughs> Sounds like your mic threw up. I didn't do that. Okay, so here you have from the New Testament, here you have that God in a certain place is speaking of the seventh day in this way. And what God is saying is that and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So what is this text taking you back to? It's taking you back to Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of everything, right? So what you know is that on day one, God did this. Day two, God did that. Day three, four, five, and six. God did everything. On day six, was that the last day of creation? He had made and accomplished everything. So when the seventh day came, did he look around and go, man, I knew I forgot something? Or did he look and say, it's done. It's finished. And it's very good. So he was able to look and say it was complete, perfect, mature. Everything was done. And so why did God rest? Because there was nothing left to do. You need to tie this into the gospel because in Jesus Christ, is your salvation complete? Yes. Is it done? Yes. Is it finished? Yes. And it's been finished like creation that when God looked, there was nothing left to do but rest and enjoy what God has done. So when we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians look at Sabbath, we don't look at it and keep it because it's part of the law. Because the Bible tells us plenty, Paul tells us in Romans, that no flesh can be saved by keeping the law. Is that right? So and then the question is asked by our Protestant brothers, why do we keep the fourth commandment? Donald, I don't know what's going on with this thing, but you can shut it off if you have to. Um, one of the problems that we have today started with Martin Luther. You ever heard of the Anabaptists? Okay, Anabaptists. There was controversy back in his day with Anabaptists. And this one man from the Anabaptists wanted the church to keep the Ten Commandments, all of them. And Luther said, if we listen to this man, pretty soon we're going to be keeping uh, Saturday instead of Sunday. He understood, he knew. Okay? But what Luther did is Luther said, we only need to keep the natural law. You know what the natural law is? The natural law in Luther's mind was, you shall not steal, you shall not kill. So apparently there's nine things naturally, which if you think deeply, and yeah, no. 
So there was this issue about the Sabbath. That seemed more ceremonial, so you didn't have to keep that. And hence, this is one of the reasons why Protestantism today still continues to keep Sunday. But what does God's Word actually say? God gave the Sabbath to Adam and Eve for what reason? Was Adam tired? No. He was just created. I'm not sure how much he accomplished in that one day. And if he was the last thing to be created in that day, there wasn't a whole lot that he did. His first full day, what did he get to do? He got to rest in the accomplishment that God finished everything for him and supplied all his needs. And so God has continued to give his people the Sabbath throughout history to show them not you keep this so that you can be saved. Don't do this so that you can score brownie points with me. But understand that this is a sign between me and you that I am your God who sanctifies you. I am your God who has saved you. And that the Sabbath is so that we have this opportunity to look back and rest in the full, complete work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter it because of, what's that next word? Mm. Again, he designates a certain day, saying to David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Why does he now switch to Joshua? After the death of Moses, who was the leader of Israel? And did Joshua bring them into the promised land through the power of God? But did Joshua give them rest? Think about their history. Did they have total and complete rest in the land? Why? Because they kept going from belief to unbelief, belief to unbelief. They were faithful to God all the days of Joshua's life and the judges who came right after Joshua. Okay? But they didn't fulfill what God had asked them to do, and that was drive out all of the Canaanites. And because of disobedience and, again, unbelief, they never entered that rest. What rest was God trying to give them? Do you have any idea? God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God made promises to Moses, the children of Israel. He promised them a land. He promised them descendants. And He promised them rest. What was it that God was wanting to give them? And what was it that the children of Israel were looking for? Was it the same thing? That was a long question. Do you understand what the question was? <laughs> Let me rephrase it. From God's perspective, what did God want to give the nation of Israel? Just a land that could be theirs? Was, it, was that his main concern? He said he wanted to bring them into his rest. What does that mean? He wanted to be their God, and he wanted them to be his people. He wanted them to be the light and the witness to the rest of the world of who and what God was. And God wanted to bring them into that rest. That's the rest. That if they would have rested in God, God would have done everything He promised them. Is God, when we find in Peter, is God slack concerning these promises? Then why wasn't the promises fulfilled? And this was that big long question. Because this is what God wanted to do. God wanted to bring them into His salvation rest. To show the world that He is the one and only true God. The nation of Israel wanted a land. And after a certain period of time, they wanted a king. And after that, 
they wanted to be like all the other nations, right? So in the end, they kept rejecting God. God was their husband and they were the bride. And through adultery, through unfaithfulness, God divorced them. But Christ tells them, when he's looking over Jerusalem, how many times did he want to gather them under his wings? How many times did he want to love them and prosper them? And he did everything he could, but where was the problem? The problem was with them because they would not. This, brothers and sisters, is one of the greatest teachings of Adventism. And that is that if you understand the gospel, and you understand who Jesus Christ is, and you get to understand the character and nature of God the Father, you realize that He has done, not will do, He has done everything you need to be saved. But God loves you so much, and He loves your freedom of choice, that He will not force you to either accept the gift or continue to believe in the gift. That He gives you the choice. This is why Joshua said in his last speech to the children of Israel, Choose ye this day whom ye will what? Because in the end, that's what we're here for. We're not here to build bigger houses, a better country, stronger state. We're here to serve the living God. We're here to show the world that there is a God and that He has a people that He works in and through. And now God tells us that He gives us this symbol and this sign that's the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. That we look at the rest of that day, the R-E-S-T, the rest of that day, we come to Christ, we rest from our six days of labor, we come on the Sabbath day, we come together. Why? So that, again, we can score brownie points with God, or we come because we know that in Christ we are complete. And that in Christ we show the world that this same God who made promises to Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Paul, to John, to you and I, is the same God that never changes. And that when we understand the gospel of Christ, we start to understand the beauty of Sabbath keeping. We start to realize that on Sabbath, all I do is come into God's presence. And God has done the rest. It's complete. It's done. That's my salvation. I get to be in His company. I get to be in His presence. And I don't have to work for it. Isn't that great? Amen. When you start to understand your nature that you're born with, and you start to understand how bent that is against the truths of God, and the fact that in that nature you cannot stand in the presence of God, and you'll find that further on in the book of Hebrews because our God is a consuming fire, you realize, I have a problem. How do I deal with this problem? And you find that you deal with this problem through belief and faith. And the Sabbath has been given to us as a sign of that belief and faith. Amen? Amen. So let's continue to look. For Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore, verse 9, what is that? Uh, Verse said, there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. What kind of rest? It's the rest that's spoken of here that's symbolized in the seventh day. So, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now, this is where I end this morning talking about salvation here. And he brings you back to the creation of the world. That God needed to create a world 
that would fully support human love. Is that right? And on the sixth day, was that world done and complete? Yes. There was nothing more God had to do, so God was able to rest because it was done and finished. So when you're talking about your salvation rest in Christ, is there anything else that needs to be done? So this is how you're able...